you to look with me this morning. John chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading at verse 3, and I'd like for you to follow along with me. John, the 13th chapter and verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who uh, is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we know that when we come into your house, you are with us. Because you live inside of us through your Holy Spirit. And so when we come together, we bring you to the house. But Lord, this morning you've taken extra special care to reveal yourself and to let us know that you are here with us in a special way. Lord Jesus, we appreciate the example that you've given us and you made sure that it was written in your word so we could read it and study it. But this morning, impart that deeper understanding, that greater revelation by your word and your spirit working together in our hearts. And Father, we're excited about what you're going to reveal to us and even more the transformation that's going to take, in our, take place in our lives because of it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. Folks, Jesus wanted to celebrate the Passover feast with his disciples. He desired deeply, greatly. It was, a, it, was a, it was a deep desire for him that he wanted to celebrate the Passover feast with his disciples. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus had Peter and John to prepare the Passover feast for them and he had them to go into a rented upper room to prepare that Passover feast and in that same chapter Luke chapter 22 verse 15 Jesus expressed the deep importance of this Passover meal with his disciples when he said with fervent desire with fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer now this was a very unusual Passover we know the elements that are going to take place in it. We've had opportunity to study those over the years. But I want to point out some things to you. This was a very unusual Passover meal. You see, the Passover was a family celebration. The Passover was a family celebration. All of the traditions of Passover were designed to bring the family together to remember and to celebrate Israel's deliverance from bondage. Think about it. But how, however your great uh, your knowledge is about the Passover or how, uh, however minimal your knowledge is about the Passover, when you think about it, it was designed from the very beginning in Egypt Whenever God gave instruction for the families to gather together in their houses, right? Yes. 
And then they were to choose a lamb, a sacrificial lamb that was just the right size for the family to eat all in one evening and then spread the blood of the lamb over the lentils of the door of the family's home. Everything was geared for the family to get together, to, to celebrate, to remember their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. And all of the disciples, think about this, every one of the disciples had families, didn't they? Every one of the disciples, they weren't in another country. They were in Israel. They were in their own country. And every one of them had dis uh, families. The disciples had families. But they were not with their families at this Passover. They were with Jesus. Folks, I believe that speaks to us. The commitment that these disciples had to the Lord. And the commitment that Jesus had to them, that they were celebrating this, this powerful tradition that was based not only in the, in the holiday tradition, but in the religious framework of them, how they chose to celebrate this meal, this Passover, together with one another as a family. The Passover feast was important to Jesus. One, because he truly desired to fellowship with his disciples before he suffered. That was really his heart. He loved the disciples. They loved him. This was just not routine or ritual. He truly desired. A desire that he had was to fellowship with his disciples before he suffered. To spend time with his friends before he went to the cross of Calvary. Another reason it was important to Jesus is because he wanted them to know that he is the Passover lamb slain to deliver them from the bondage of sin. That all of the history of Passover from, from Egypt and the death angel until that point was pointing to him, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ so that they would know in that evening and in that time that they spent together and after, after the crucifixion of the cross it would become more clear to them that Jesus was born to die. That he is the Passover lamb slain to deliver you and I from the bondage of sin. That night as well, Jesus gave the disciples communion. Communion is one of the greatest continuing illustrations of Jesus' love and his sacrifice on the cross. Last Sunday morning, we celebrated communion here and how wonderful it is that Jesus, knowing our makeup, knew that we needed something physical to connect and he gave us that phrase, this do in remembrance of me. This do in remembrance of me. Uh, this do, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, what? Until he comes. Here we are 2,000 years later and we still have this visual picture of Christ's love for us because he gave that to the disciples on this night knowing what was going to happen to him the next day. But Jesus had another lesson to teach at the Passover. Jesus had another lesson to teach at the Passover. You see, in the Near Eastern cultural teaching was done in a couple of ways. One, it was done orally by repetition. They would repeat the stories over and over again. They were very careful about the wording as they would present them. They would bring in the young men and the young men would, uh, would learn under the rabbi and they would repeat the stories to them over and over again because it was the job of the father to repeat those same stories. And as pastor is saying stories, I'm talking about historical record account of what happened in the nation of Israel. They had another powerful way of doing it as well, not just oral tradition, but they also had that visual with illustration. Jesus loved to teach in parables, didn't he? He would take the common things that were around them every day, things that they could see while he was teaching, and he would, he would tie in the spiritual truth to that visual so that they had an immediate visual connection between what he was teaching and that environment that was around them every day. We've got some teachers here today, and some of the things that teachers will tell you is that you have to have several approaches to teaching if they're going to remember Many times when I'm teaching on Wednesday night, you may or may not realize this, but we're using several methods to teach. We, we have you to see it. We have you to hear it. 
We have you to write it down, amen. Then we have you rehearse it back, what you're, what you're learning. And, and when you walk out of here, you have a better opportunity to have retained and remembered what we were talking about. Although I'm not going to be brave enough to ask you what the title of last Wednesday night's study was. <laughs> And so Jesus used a powerful illustration to teach a life-changing lesson at that night. Look with me again, John chapter 13, beginning at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him, given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Jesus took that practical, mundane practice of washing feet and turned it into a powerful illustration of servant leadership. He was teaching them servant leadership leadership. See, it was the responsibility of the host to provide for the washing of the feet for their guests. Every good Jew knew that. Every individual knew that if somebody came under your house, if they came to visit you, that part of your traditional responsibility was to provide for them. You see, you either provided water for them and they washed their own feet, or you provided a servant who would wash their feet for them. That, that was part of tradition. Any, any good Jew would know that, just like you know any good Southerner knows if somebody stops at your house, you offer them a glass of iced tea, right? Oh, maybe that's old tradition. I don't know. Maybe today it's a Coke Zero. I'm not sure. But you offer them something to drink, right? Somebody stops by. Well, well the Jew knew that you offered them for their feet to be washed. It was a very practical thing. It was very important because they traveled on dusty roads in, 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 in their sandaled feet. And so it was very necessary after a long journey for them to be able to have the comfort of some clean feet. You see, we kind of think that they liked walking around with dirty feet, but how many of y'all like walking around with dirty feet? No, they didn't like it either. And so they would wash their feet. If they were in somebody else's home, there was no way they could do that on their own. They needed their host to provide that for them. And so it was a very important part of being a good host in the nation of Israel. But this was a rented room, right? This was a rented room. It, the house didn't belong to any of them. The, uh, they, 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 they didn't have that same understanding. And so foot washing is supposed to be done at the beginning of the evening. When the guests first arrive is when you offer them the water to wash their feet or the servant to wash their feet for them. But now, here we are. Supper's already over and still nobody's taken the responsibility of providing for this very needed and practical mundane responsibility of washing their feet. Luke records that the disciples got into a heated discussion here at the Last Supper. I love the Gospels because if you read from the different Gospels, you get different points of view, different aspects. They don't contradict each other. They just blend the story and give you more understanding and information. And Luke tells us that the disciples got into a heated discussion. And chapter 22, beginning at verse 24, it says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Doesn't that sound strange? And he, Jesus, said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sets at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sets at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Is it possible that this dispute is what caused Jesus to get up from the table, take off his garments, put water in a basin and tie a towel around his waist? and begin washing the disciples' feet. 
see, Jesus knew his authority when he knelt down to wash the disciples' feet. I love John. John the Apostle is great. He gives such powerful spiritual commentary all through his text. If you're reading, he does it so good, it flows so well that we might not realize what he's doing, but he gives us deep insight into what's happening in his commentary. And so we find in John chapter 13, verse 3, John giving us commentary. He said, Jesus knowing that the Father had given what? all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going to God. You see, Jesus knew that he had the authority over the entire universe. Think about that. God himself sitting at the supper table knew that he had authority over all of the universe, every bit of it. He also knew that pretty soon he was going to be seated at the right hand of the Father once again on his throne in heaven. And Jesus had all this understanding. He had all this knowledge of his authority. And so what did Jesus do with all of that authority? He knelt down and washed the disciples' feet. Then Jesus sat down to bring the point to his lesson and to bring it home. John chapter 13, beginning of verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. That's the truth. Lord. Verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Jesus asked this question. He said, do you understand? Do you know? Do you understand what I have done to you? Listen, the God, the creator of the universe, has just washed your feet. Do you understand why? Come on. God, the creator of the universe, has just washed your feet. Do you understand why? Jesus wanted to know if the disciples truly understood or if they just received clean feet. I want you to think about that for a moment. Did they truly understand what was going on? Did they truly understand what was happening? Or did they just receive clean feet? See, Jesus will take us through life lessons to teach us what we need to know to grow. Has anybody ever experienced some of the life lessons that God allows us to go through? Some of the things that he allows to happen in our lives to teach us and to instruct us. How many of you all know that life lessons can be fun, but most of the time, this is for the teachers today, most of the time they ain't. <laughs> the scripture tells us that if the Lord loves us, he showers us with blessings all of the time. No, my Bible says if the Lord loves you, he, he chastens you. Now, just in case you're not familiar with Old English, let, let me put it in Southern, right? He whoops your behind. If he loves you, he, he whoops your behind. I don't know about you, but there is nothing, there is nothing in my makeup that enjoys getting my behind whooped. I didn't like it when mama did it and daddy did it when I was a boy and I sure don't like it now when I'm a man when my heavenly father who is a who is God and who is good and who loves me takes me to the woodshed who who who, who takes the belt off and gives me a little good discipline and instruction and, and I've got to tell you folks I would much rather my daddy take his belt off than the heavenly father discipline me because when my father gave me a whoop and it stung and it hurt but it was over pretty quick when my heavenly father begins to teach me he said 
you're going to be in this class until you get it. Come on, you're going to be in this class until you graduate. Come on. If you don't get it the first time, I'm going to bring you right back around again. You're going to find yourself right in this place because you haven't got it yet. And if you're going to be strong, if you're going to be able to endure the attacks of the enemy, if you're going to have the shield of faith to be able to hold up the quenches, all the fiery darts of the enemy, you've got to get this life lesson down so you know how to be strong in the presence of the attacks of the enemy. God loves us. And he takes us through those life lessons. The question is, are we really learning or are we just receiving clean feet? Is it just appreciating the blessing that God gives us? Are we really learning from the things that he's doing and working in our lives by his word and by his spirit? You see, when we search for God's heart... When we search for God's heart in the middle of our life lessons, then we learn the spiritual truths that will help us to grow. I'm so glad that the Heavenly Father loves me and loves you so much Amen. that he wants us to learn these things. And as we look at the example that Jesus gave, he washed the disciples' feet, didn't he? Come on, that's what he did. He washed their feet. In this simple act of servant leadership, Jesus reinforced every lesson that he'd ever taught. In this moment, he reinforced every lesson that he ever taught. I don't have time to go through them at all, but just let me give you some examples of powerful truths that he modeled before the disciples in this moment. See, the disciples had no way of knowing that this was their final lesson. How many of you all know when somebody's coming to the end of their life, what they have to say is very important? I don't know too many people that coming to the end of their life and knowing that this might be the last time they have time to speak to family members, I don't know of anybody that chooses frivolous things to talk about. They begin to talk and share about things that are important to them, things that they feel like that family member needs to know. That's the time whenever I've seen family members that have held offense and grudge realize that life is too short and their family member's about ready to go. So now it's time to reconcile. Now it's time to set things right. Now it's time to say I'm sorry or to apologize or to give forgiveness. Now it's time to speak wisdom. I remember of one grandmother that brought in every one of her children and grandchildren, spoke to them one at a time. And she said, look, I don't have much time left and I've been trying to tell you this for years, so let me just, and she just gave it to them straight. Not in a mean way, but a loving way. What she saw in their life, the choices that they were making and the blessings that God had for them. And you know that made a transition, a transformation in almost, and I have to say almost, in almost every one of those children and grandchildren's lives. It's important. And so this was their final lesson. Jesus knew it was their final lesson. They didn't know that, but Jesus did, and so he packed it full of truth. Jesus reinforced Mark chapter 9, verse 35. He said at that time, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And here we see Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, doing what? Washing the disciples' feet. Jesus reinforced Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45. He said there, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Come on, Jesus. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Do you think he made his point? That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun, his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus, the righteous judge, washed Judas, his betrayer's feet. See, it wasn't just about 
theory for him. It wasn't just philosophy for him. It was real life living under kingdom principles. He had taught it. He had spoke it. But now on this evening, he is making his point clear by illustrating it to them that they could remember. Jesus reinforced John chapter 15 verses 12 and 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this you know what it says? Then to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus, the Son of God, gave his life for us. See, it's all about practical servanthood that demonstrates the love of God. Practical servanthood that demonstrates the love of God. This Thursday, we're going over to Pine Grove Elementary School. And we're going to wash the teacher's feet. I got this basin of water up here. We're going to wash the teacher's feet by giving them the paper that they need. By serving them. You were a little nervous, weren't you, Lindsay? <laughs> by humbling ourselves and serving them a hot breakfast by stopping everything that we're doing and going to where they're at and minister to them a practical need you see over the years foot washing became a tradition in the churches I, I know that I grew up in churches where they washed feet but in reality nobody needed their feet washed because they knew it was a foot washing service and so they would come with clean feet <laughs> now somebody will say TMI pastor TMI but I got to tell you I have to go see the dermatologist and the dermatologist checks every part of Pastor Hensel's being. And the socks come off and he checks in between the toes. I want you to know I make sure those toes are clean before I let anybody inspect them. And so it was a good tradition because it was still humbling to wash somebody's feet. But Jesus washed their feet because it was a need. It was a practical need. It was a reality. And in that practical need, he demonstrated how we serve one another. We see what's needed in the lives of other people. And because of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in us, we reach out to minister to the practical need of those individuals. And therefore, we wash their feet. Amen. Not because they washed our feet first. But because the love of God in us says, I'm going to be a son or a daughter of God. And I'm going to demonstrate the love of Jesus to these individuals. Folks, when we first started going over to Pine Grove, there were individuals who knew when it was going to be time to pray. And they made sure they wasn't there. There were individuals, as we passed out information to them, they'd take the eggs, but they wouldn't take the information. But I want to let you know that we've been going over there year after year after year. And I believe even though some of the teachers, some of the individuals may not be believers yet, they still appreciate us because we've demonstrated the love of Jesus Christ to them. Amen. Give God praise. God is so good. God is so good. You know that as a church, we honor our uh, sheriff's department by feeding them lunch. We honor our fire department by going and feeding them lunch. Sister Fran and I and some others were at one of the fire stations. We, we took the lunch in. We sat down with them as they ate. We had conversation with them as they had the lunch we prepared. And, and, and I was going to pray for them. And the, uh, the deputy chief was there. And he understands all the politics and dynamics of that. And so whenever he knew we were getting to that place where I was going to pray over them, he said... And I knew that there were gentlemen sitting around that table that were not believers, not Christians. And he said, now, Pastor Hensel is going to pray. Uh, and you don't have to stay for this if you don't want to. He's going to pray and hand out Bibles. And if you don't want to be here for that, please feel free. Go do something else. Not one man left. And every one of them took a Bible. Amen. You see, when you wash people's feet, they sense the love of God and then they're ready to hear what you have to say because you've already ministered in their lives. Amen? Amen. 
Jesus had the disciples full attention when he sat down after washing their feet. They might have been arguing before that happened, but when Jesus got up, the king of glory, and began washing their feet, he had their full attention, and he said to them, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, John doesn't record the, the disciples' response. I find that interesting. After Jesus asks that question, after he puts it out there to the disciples, John doesn't record what the disciples, it doesn't say anything from any of the disciples how they responded to it. But I believe we can determine their response from their lives. Because every single one of the disciples, except for Judas, the son of perdition, spent the entirety of the rest of their life sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ through the love of God to everybody they had opportunity to share it with until tradition says that each and every one of them lost their lives sharing the love of Jesus Christ with others. I believe their response was this, pass me the water basin, Jesus. Amen. Come on, pass me Jesus, pass me the water basin. Pass me the water basin, Jesus. Jesus made them a promise. In John chapter 13, verse 17, he said, now that you know these things, now that you know these things, listen, God will bless you for doing them. That promise is for you and I today. Now that we know these things, God will bless you and I for doing them. So what's our response going to be? See, see, we're sitting here just the same as the disciples in the presence of God. Jesus is here. He's asking us that question because he has washed my feet and washed your feet over and over again and the blessings he has poured out in our lives. Are we going to declare with him by the way we live our lives? Pass me the water basin, Jesus. Pass me the water basin. Jesus. Amen. And so now I'm going to ask Dennis Camacho to come and I'm going to wash Dennis's feet this morning. Have you ever had your feet washed? For those of you who've had your feet washed and possibly have you ever washed somebody else's feet? Which is which is which is harder? To wash somebody's feet or let somebody else wash your feet? <laughs> it's harder to let somebody else wash your feet. Both of them can be difficult, but I got to tell you, I'd rather wash somebody else's feet than have them wash mine. But I've been humbled in that place where somebody literally said, Pastor, sit down, took off my shoes and my socks and washed my feet. Tears running down my cheeks. Every, every, every bit of pride just wiped out of the way. Because I had to let somebody else. Folks, that's the other side of this coin. We have to be humble enough that it's not just about what we do for others, but what we allow others to do for us. And that's the way the body of Christ works, amen? Amen. See, we have to do it first to the body of Christ. But then we have to wash the feet of those who are outside of the body of Christ so that they can know the heart of God for themselves. And the enemy's telling so many lies. And he's painting pictures about God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that are so untrue. Yes. I was about to use a term, but I'd get myself in trouble, so I won't go there today we know don't we we know the truth and it set us free in our hearts because of that freedom and under the anointing of God he's going to use us in a powerful way to let the light of Jesus Christ shine Matthew says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good intentions they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven